Good evening. Welcome, and thank you for coming this evening. My name is Barb May. I'm the Academic Dean at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's um, University, and I want to take a brief minute before we start to provide the reason uh, for this presentation tonight. Tonight's event is the fourth annual Norman L. Ford Science Literacy Lecture. This lecture series addresses contemporary and cutting edge scientific topics while encouraging students and the public to become more conversant with the relevance of science in our everyday lives. The series is made possible through the generous support of an anonymous St. John's alumnus who wanted to honor one of his favorite and most inspiring professors, Norman Ford, Professor Emeritus of Biology. Dr. Ford taught biology at St. Ben's and St. John's for 31 years, from 1967 until his retirement in 1998. He was a specialist in ornithology and was widely published in his field. Dr. Ford's not only remembered for his scholarly activity, but is also warmly remembered and admired for the hundreds of students he taught during his years here. His skill in teaching was formally recognized in 1998 when St. John's presented him the Robert L. Spaeth Teacher of Distinction Award. In many ways, this lecture series in Dr. Ford's honor is a continuation of Norm's mission as our speakers call us all to be more perceptive and understanding of our world. I want to welcome students, faculty, staff, and the community to tonight's fourth annual event. I want to thank the donor for allowing us to bring Dr. Seely to campus today. In addition, the donor kindly provided 150, 150 copies of the book, What We're Fighting For Now Is Each Other, Dispatches from the Front Lines of Climate Change, written by Wen Stevenson. It, this has been read and discussed by students, faculty, and staff. I would also um, like to make you aware of a few details. There are some uh, microphones on either side, and we'll ask that you use those. As Dr. Seeley finishes his presentation, there will be some time for questions. And welcome you to join, a, to join us for cookies and refreshments after, after the uh, talk. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Joe Storling, Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies at St. Ben's and St. John's, and he will introduce Dr. Seeley as our fourth distinguished lecturer for this event. Thank you so much. It's uh, great to see so many student faces here uh, this evening, as well as my faculty peers and colleagues. Um, it's certainly my distinct pleasure this evening to introduce Dr. Mark Seeley as our 2018 Norm L. Ford Science Literacy Lecture Series speaker. <clears throat> when we began searching for speakers for the topic of climate change last year, I had a hard time thinking of many people who could represent this lecture better than Dr. Seeley. Mark is a well-known and highly respected in the scientific community for his ability to take complex scientific problems or data and present it in a simple, elegant way that anyone can understand or relate to. Dr. Seeley joins us this evening from his recent retirement from the University of Minnesota's Department of Soil, Water, and Climate after serving as an extension meteorologist and climatologist for 40 years. He remains a distinguished member of that department through his new role as Professor Emeritus. With the University of Minnesota, Dr. Seeley managed the weather and climate education program as well as doing research and teaching. Throughout his career, Dr. Seeley's outreach and service to our state and its citizens has been inspiring. Since 1992, he has been providing us with weather and climate information through his weekly newsletter blog, Minnesota Weather Talk. And I know many of us here this evening will recognize the warm voice of Dr. Seeley from his service discussing weather and climate on Minnesota Public Radio's Morning Edition news pro program every week. Dr. Seeley has also helped Twin Cities Public Television produce award-winning documentaries on Minnesota's most memorable historic weather events and how climate change is affecting the state's infrastructure and natural resources. He is the author of the Minnesota Weather Almanac. First edition came out in 2006 and then updated again, second edition in 2015. He also is the co-author of Voyager Skies, The Weather and the Wilderness of Minnesota's National Park, which is an award-winning book about the state's only national park. Dr. Seeley has been honored with numerous awards, some of which include the Minnesota Crop Production Retailers Association Outstanding Service Award, Minnesota Agri-Growth Council Distinguished Service Award, 
The SEAL Prize in Agriculture for Lifetime Contributions of Knowledge to the Agricultural Sciences, the University President's Award for Outstanding Community Service, the Scientific Communication and Education Award from Sigma Xi, and the University of Minnesota Extension Dean and Director's Award. Finally, Dr. Seeley knows the history of climate in Minnesota, period. I don't think there's anybody else that knows as much history of our climate as the guy coming up here in just a couple minutes. He knows our climate is changing, and he's been a champion for alerting us to the need that we need to take action. Tonight, Dr. Seeley is going to touch on this and provide some lessons that he's learned in his 40 years career as a climatologist. Please join me in a warm CSB SJU welcome for Dr. Mark Seeley. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> I've been having a grand day here. First, I need to say thank you for it because uh, your, in, your committee has been uh, wonderful, wonderfully hosting the day for me. I shared with them that I haven't been to your campus since April of 1985 uh, when I was here for a climate forum. Uh, so it's been a long time and there's many, many new things to see and I've enjoyed the day. I've enjoyed my engagement with the students and faculty and uh, I still have enough gas left in the gas tank for maybe about one more hour. Uh, I uh, am going to share a journey for me uh, that is a, a lifelong journey in terms of climate science, uh, climate literacy, climate change. Uh, I'm going to share uh, some personal stories as well as some scientific data and some scientific stories. And uh, with all that said, I hope we'll also have time to have an exchange among us uh, before we wrap up the time today. So again, my gratitude and thanks for inviting me to come here and uh, I, re I really appreciate it. And uh, I have a great amount of respect for uh, this institution. I think it's been enhanced by my visit here today. <laughs> I, I need to uh, also acknowledge uh, I'm member number 8,112 of the International Cloud Appreciation Society, and proud of it. Uh, it's an uh, it's interesting organization and society that founded by Gavin Pretor Piney. Has anybody in this room joined the Cloud Appreciation Society? We, we, you guys got to get on the stick here. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a great organization, clouds from all over the world. Their website hosts the largest cloud atlas in the world and is used in the teaching of meteorology in several institutions that teach cloud classification. But we're not going to go down that path tonight. I just, I just wanted to show you the slide. So I, I reformatted or changed this around several times as I'm prone to do when I think through uh, the process of putting a presentation together. Uh, the Ethics of Scientific Communication and the Challenges to Public Education about Climate Change, a Minnesota Perspective. I want you to know that dominantly what I'm going to share, although a few, to, few of my remarks are broader than Minnesota, but dominantly what I'm going to show you and talk about tonight is very Minnesota-centric. The reason I do that is by experience I know that people of our state, regardless of whether they're students or seniors or engaged professionals or whatever their call in life at the moment is, are more inclined to be engaged by what's happening in our own backyards. So that's partially why I'm Minnesota-centric, but there's also some interesting stories about Minnesota to tell. The other thing I've done in the formatting of this is I'm going to save the ethics piece until last. I'm not going to start off with ethics, but I'm going to conclude with ethics, and I hope that'll be okay with you. I will show you a body of evidence that should you have a uh, Thanksgiving conversation, which we have coming up pretty soon, with the old family or the neighbors or whatever, whatever you're gathering for the holiday, or for that matter, if you have such a gathering for the Christmas holiday and the topic of climate 
and climate change comes up, you will have a body of evidence freshly planted in your mind to call on if anybody asks you questions or perspective on this particular topic. One piece that we all need to acknowledge in, is, is our highly variable climate here in Minnesota. We not only live in one of the most highly variable geographic climates in the USA, we live in one of the most highly variable climates in the world. That's exemplified by just looking at what's taken place on any particular date of the year across the Minnesota landscape. Uh, so, for example, on today's date, we have the same day length in play, we have the same sun angle in play, but here in Collegeville, we've had 76 degrees back in 1989, and we had 18 degrees in 2002. We had a thunderstorm with over one inch of uh, rainfall in 2010, and seven-tenths of an inch of snow in 1981. So Mother Nature's roll of the dice on this particular date has brought quite a broad range of conditions. We're also one of the few states, uh, we're one of the few geographic spots in the Northern Hemisphere that's had 114 degrees in the summer and minus 60 in the winter. So that requires creative wardrobes. <laughs> um, another premise or piece of basic framework that I need to lay out for you is not mine at all. It's Professor Stan Chagnon, one of the most decorated climate scientists of the 20th century from Illinois. But many of us in the discipline still use his famous paper from the 1990s in which he wrote and described and used a graphic to illustrate the changing perspective, the changing human perspective of how we, as a species on Earth, perceive climate behavior. So if you'll bear with me for a moment, the stationary perception of climate behavior, graphically illustrated in the top graph here, is our founding father's perception of climate behavior. And that is premised on the notion that if you measure climate at the same point on Earth day after day for enough years, you will gather all the knowledge you need to know about climate behavior at that geographic point. You'll be able to describe the means or the central character, the average temperatures or precipitation, if you will, the seasonality and what the seasons look like, the extremes, the standard deviations, if you're a statistician, a whole range of things. The country for well over 150 years or so was built on this premise. This was the stationary perception of climate behavior. Then the middle graphic, we got along to the middle part of the 20th century and climatologists started discovering, especially in places like Minnesota, that the climate did behave sort of like a, st a stationary perspective, but the variability about the central characters, the variability about the means, waxed and waned. And what they meant by that was that sometimes it seems like the climate got stuck in a rut, and one year was like the next, was like the next, was like the next, and so one year was a good predictor of what next year was going to be like. But also, that kind of fooled us because then we'd go into periods of more enhanced variability where one year was distinctly not like the next. And it was so variable, you'd have a wet year followed by a drought year, you'd have a hot year followed by a cold year, etc. And we have many examples of this kind of climate behavior in the state of Minnesota where we've gone through, even in our own lifetimes, even in our own lifetimes, where we've gone through periods of enhanced variability and then we've gone through periods of compressed variability. And now in the last couple of decades, especially the last couple of decades, the trend shift perspective of climate behavior has taken hold. And this is a very important one because given that you don't disturb the landscape and nothing about the climate or the uh, factors that drive the climate change, 
you could say that the stationary perception of climate was valid, that we went on for a period of decades and the climate behaved within certain statistical bounds. But then all of a sudden something changes and the more and more of our daily, monthly, and annual measurements start to fall outside the historical range. We have no historical analogy for the climate behavior that we have today. And this is where the climate change theme comes into play. Big time, this particular graphical description of Minnesota is very accurate in my lifetime as your extension climatologist. And it's partially the reason why I had to write two editions of the Minnesota Weather Almanac, because when Joel intro Joe introduced me, the first version came out in 2006, and I documented all the statistics and all the uh, significant events from 1807 to 2005, and I computed all the statistics and I presented those in the book. But since 2005, between 2005 and 2015, in our observational network in the state of Minnesota, we set over 17,000 new daily climate records. We set over 170 new statewide records where we measured something that never in the history of measurement in Minnesota had we ever measured. So that exemplifies that the pace of change has quickened and that we need to do our updates on climate behavior in Minnesota with a greater frequency. We can't do this so-called book computation of Minnesota statistics every lifetime. That's not going to work because our climate is changing too fast. Now why is that important? And that's where the verbiage comes into play. Our perceptions historically of climate behavior are built into the framework by which we manage our natural resources and we manage our infrastructure. It's based on historical climate behavior. So the way we manage our watersheds, our streams, our lakes, the way we manage our forests, our wetlands, the way we manage our infrastructure, our fresh water supply, our electric utility grid, our transportation system, our public health system, is all geared to be effective and efficient for us in the context of the way we used to understand climate behavior. But that climate behavior has changed. So if we want to maintain the effectiveness of our natural resource management and our infrastructure management, we darn well better adapt. And we better get busy doing it. Denying it is exactly the wrong thing to do. Okay? And we're not the only state in this particular dilemma. In our state, we've studied, these are the most intensely studied attributes of the Minnesota state climate. I could talk about more, but they're lesser documented. We still have a wonderful faculty uh, all over the state investigating other parameters, but these are the three that are most commonly written about. The temperature change, the moisture change, and the water vapor in the atmosphere change. And so I'll use data to illustrate some of this. The overall temperature picture that we know from the IPCC reports as they've evolved since the 1990s is that in across the entire Earth climate system, we see disparity or differences in the change in temperature. We see vast warming going on in most places in the, in the Earth system, but we see differences in the amplitude. Some places are getting warmer faster than other places. Some geographic places, the warming has been modest, and some it's been very profound. We all know in recent literature, for example, how the polar regions of Canada are changing profoundly. I mean, they're, they're making some of the changes at lower latitudes look minuscule in terms of what's going on in the polar latitudes. Uh, we all know there's seasonality to the character of this uh, temperature change. 
Some areas of the globe are seeing the most profound change in their winter season, the season of long nights and short days, while others are seeing more profound temperature change in their summer season, or maybe one of the shoulder seasons, autumn or spring. Depends on what geography you're looking at. Here in Minnesota and the Western Great Lakes region, we occupy a piece of real estate that's seen some of the most profound temperature changes in winter. And this is why we have so many Minnesota citizens that lament the loss of an old fashioned Minnesota winter, especially if they're used to doing a lot of outdoor recreational activities in winter. We also have run through in the new millennium a whole string of extraordinarily warm years that leave an extraordinary footprint across the U.S. landscape. This is the footprint of the temperature anomaly just last year in 2017. And you can tell by the coloration here, so the coastal Carolinas and Georgia had their all-time warmest year in history in 2017, as did New Mexico and Arizona. But the brown tinted states were in the top 10 warmest historically as well. We call that a King Kong footprint. Normally we don't see a footprint like that because when we dissect the USA database year by year, we see a lot more variability. We tend to see some states were colder than their historic average and some were warmer. In other words, we see more of a mixed bag. But in recent years, especially as the climate has warmed, we see larger and larger geographic footprints of warmth on the North American continent. Uh, and then there's the net result. We also have the net result over a century of data compiled by the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And the coloration here shows areas of the U.S. that have seen in the light and dark red, some of the most pronounced temperature change over the last century. We have all heard about Alaska and especially the North Slope of Alaska. But by golly, look at our home state. Look at our home state. And this also explains a little bit about the politics of climate change, or at least the on the floor of Congress politics of climate change because those who represent us in government are supposed to represent their constituencies. And so we have on the floors of Congress each year, uh, when issues related to climate change and climate change policy come up, we have representatives and senators from some of these states that we see highlighted in red. We see them up there proactively championing, championing the, the legislation to do something about climate change and then conversely, we look down here in the southeastern and southern Plains states where there's been no net change in temperature historically or there's been negative change. And these uh, representatives are standing up there saying, what are you talking about? What, what, what's going on? Where's this coming from? Okay, because they tend to pay attention to what's going on in their own constituents' backyards. So we have a disparity like that in play but then when we look at the data, it's very pronounced that in our lifetime, this is all Minnesota, this is a population of all data in the state. We have 252 individual climate histories in the state of Minnesota to compile. And if we pull them all together, you can see the extraordinary number of years, warm years, that we've been going through in our lifetime. And you can see where the trend line dissected back to the late 19th century lies here. Uh, you can also see the seasonality character to it. It's a more steep, uh, steeper upward slope in the winter season, December, January, February, which is now statewide four degrees warmer than it used to be. And we have some individual geographies in Minnesota where it's six and seven degrees warmer than it used to be. And then we have a little more modest slope in some of the other seasons of the year. What we call normal, when we derive the new normals, which were, which were mandated by law to do every complete decade, we see stepwise as we do that statistically, we see an increase in the base values that we call normal or average for a location, month by month. So as we step through time, these were the net changes when we transferred from the 1971 to 2000 reference period to the 1981 to 2010 reference 
period. These will change again, almost universally in a positive direction, when we migrate after 2020 to use the 1991 to 2020 period as our normals or averaging period. You can pick any location on the U of M climate website, you can pick any location in Minnesota with a climate history and you can dissect these. This is an example for what's happened at Austin. This is an example for what's happened at Grand Rapids. Now, the deceptive thing about this, this there's, a, there's an argument to be made here that this isn't good for us. And the argument is that when we present in the media modern climate statistics, we use the most modern averaging period to reference normal. So when we listen to the radio or watch the news tonight and they say Collegeville was, uh, the high today was 52, which is seven degrees warmer than normal or whatever, or we read in the newspaper that uh, Marshall was three degrees warmer than normal or whatever it is, that's warmer than the current normal, which is warmer than the old normal, which is warmer than the old older normal, which is warmer than the oldest normal, and so it deceptively disguises the true magnitude of change that's occurred across generations of Minnesota citizens. Uh, we also, when we dissect these, we find out in some geographic regions, including Minnesota and Wisconsin, around the Great Lakes region, that the minimum temperatures are changing more profoundly than the maximum temperatures. This is a point of harmony when we have national and international meetings because those who are measurement climatologists like Dr. Seeley and those who are modeling climatologists like Dr. Hansen or Dr. Trenberth, this is a point of agreement for us where we kind of shake hands and get along real well and don't have arguments, which is pretty good. Uh, because the modelers tell us in our band of latitude and in our type of landscape, climate change signals are going to be more profound in the minimums than the maximums. They're going to be more exhibited in the season of long nights and short days than the season of long days and short nights because the changing composition of the atmosphere will have a more pronounced effect on the season of long nights and short days. We can see that exemplified month by month here, where in the winter months, the amplitude of net change in maximum red bar, minimum blue bar, is larger than the other seasons but we can also note that the minimums are changing at twice the pace throughout the year that the maximums are changing. Exemplified in one of our historical, uncontaminated, pristine climate records from Chippewa County in western Minnesota on the Milan Farm. I mean on the Op Jordan Farm. The Op Jordan Farm has been in the state's climate network since 1890 with daily observations by the Op Jordan family on an undisturbed agricultural landscape. So there's been no contamination of the data. Uh, the only downside of that 100 and what's now 120 or 30 year record is that in all that time, four generations of Op Jordans missed three observations. <laughs> Not quite perfect. But nevertheless, you can see the net change there in their values. So formerly back in the middle and late 20th century, average January minimum was minus 4.3. Today it's almost plus four. Same landscape, same position in the Minnesota landscape. Uh, same thing with February or March. Huge scale changes. Aside from the central character, we also look at the extremes. So the population of extremes, for example, nights in the winter season with a reading of minus 30 or colder. Those are disappearing. Those are, are, are showing diminished frequency. 
with changes in our climate. We don't get, we don't get as cold as often as we used to. And so our, our, the bragging rights of, uh, we talked about this with the students a little bit earlier today, you know, the bragging rights of the nation's icebox in International Falls as kind of the coveted place for manufacturers to test their products, the durability and endurance of their products, that's going to be gone in a few more decades because, quite frankly, the climate of International Falls is going to be analogous to the climate of the Twin Cities today. Um, in looking at precipitation, the observed precipitation, now this is a more complex one, and the models tell us it should be complex. They dovetail nicely with the measurements. Some areas of the globe are getting drier, some are getting wetter. Uh, in Minnesota, we happen to be uh, in a landscape that is getting wetter, and we followed that trend in 2017, in that historically we ranked 84th, which is in the wet part of the distribution. And then if you look at the century-long trends, you see all the green highlighted area in our country that's getting wetter and wetter. And conversely, you see the brown highlighted area that's getting drier and drier. We had a conversation over dinner tonight where I pointed out my friend Nancy Sellover in the Arizona State Climate Office has been trying to convince Arizona lawmakers that after 21 consecutive years of drought, in northern Arizona, their climate might be changed. <laughs> you know, but there's still a lot of people that uh, live in Arizona and are responsible for governance in Arizona that think the Arizona climate is going to revert to the 1960s one day. But we, we're in one of the wetter, we're in one of the wetter ones, and almost all of our data substantiate this. Here's the statewide trend with all observations factored in. And you can see the uh, trend towards wetter years. We're almost three inches wetter in total annual precipitation than we used to be. Here's the geographic footprint of that. So I'd like you to pay attention to the light and dark blue coloration on the Minnesota map, which is an average annual precipitation of 29 inches or greater. This is what that distribution looked like 1891 to 1920. Here it is with a shrunken area during the Dust Bowl era of the 1930s. So we just had the southeastern parts of the state that had that much average annual precipitation. Then it began to expand in the later 20th century and now slightly over half the Minnesota landscape has an average annual precipitation of that amount or greater. The seasonality again, like the temperature seasonality, is somewhat variable in the slope of the line or the trend line but they're all upward in each season of the year. And then the normals have changed across time. So again, you can pick any of the individual climate histories in the state, and you can see how the normals have changed, and they're wetter. So that Faribault, Minnesota is now 31% wetter than the 1921 to 1950 period. Grand Rapids is now 22% wetter. And you can look at this for a variety of locations around the state. Now, very importantly, and those of you that have listened to us on NPR or on TPT over the years, or those of you that have read the Minnesota Weather Almanac know that embedded in that signal of overall increasing annual precipitation is another disturbance in the climate character, and that is the increased frequency of intense precipitation events. And the National Weather Service has studied this very intently. So the frequency, even here at Collegeville, I looked at the stats, and the frequency of, say, 2-inch rains, 3-inch rains, 4-inch rains, etc. And it's all upward. It's all upward. Now, one revealing paper, a study that came out in the last five or six years, <coughs> the American Association of State Climatologists did a nationwide study on what they call the incidence of these mega rain events. So first off, what, how did the AASC describe a mega rain event? It's down here at the bottom. It's a large thunderstorm event that produces a six inch rainfall total in less than 24 hours 
that covers a minimum of a thousand square miles. So it's a big swath, it's not a little swath. And has a central core value of eight inches or greater. They did this state by state. I'm only showing you the results for the state of Minnesota. In the first 140 years of our Minnesota state history, we had seven of these. Highly destructive. Some of you that are a bit older in the room probably remember this one from 1987, as I do, when we got a 10-inch rain in the Twin Cities in six hours. And we completely flooded out the whole system in the, in the Twin Cities. But the disturbing feature in this study is that since 2002, we've had seven more. So seven in 140 years, and then seven more since 2002. Very, very, very destructive. There's a, a lot of difficulty in trying to mitigate a storm of this in intensity. The other characteristic deserving of attention about these type of storms in our Minnesota geography is that they have no preferred geography. They can occur anywhere in the state. They can occur uh, up on the Canadian border around Lake of the Woods, East Central Minnesota, Western Minnesota, South Central Minnesota, Southeastern Minnesota. They can happen anywhere. And we've had these deliver up to 17.7 inches in one storm total. Now, how do you cope with that? Uh, in addition, the variability is amplified. I talked earlier about variability, and variability is another important character of climate behavior. And so, aside from those intense storm events that affect some Minnesota geography year to year, and of course the, year, the ge geography in play this year in terms of extraordinary wetness is southwestern Minnesota. Many of those areas, for the students that are from southwestern Minnesota, you already know you're in for maybe a historically wet year down in that neck of the woods. But also the areas that get missed then go into drought. And so you can see what's happened here. The new millennium has shown a frequency of severe to extreme drought that has mandated or shown up in 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. That's kind of a disturbing frequency in having to cope with severe to extreme drought. Uh, in 2012, we had nationwide the largest declared drought in our country's history. In August of 2012, the USDA Secretary of Agriculture declared severe to extreme drought emergency in over 2,200 American counties, uh, including 57 in the state of Minnesota the largest single declaration of drought disaster since 1936. Uh, here's what 1936 looked like. But in, 19, or in 2020, uh, 2012, there was what we call a singular characteristic that was different than all previous droughts in Minnesota history. And that's depicted on this map, where the color coding shows the counties in Minnesota that we were declared for disaster, drought disaster, with all symptoms of drought in play. 30% or greater crop loss, suspended irrigation permits, water restrictions and rationing in communities, high fire danger, and a whole host of other things. And yet simultaneously, in these counties with the plus sign embedded in them, they were at the same moment in time declared by FEMA to be flood disasters. Now that's a head scratcher, isn't it? So if you're a resident in one of those counties, in one of those Minnesota counties in 2012, you can apply for federal assistance or federal loan, low interest loans for either drought recovery or flood recovery. First and only time in Minnesota history that our climate behavior has been so erratic that it has led to this circumstance. Then we have the water vapor. Now the water vapor piece is a personal one for me because those of you that can look up here, you're looking at a former football player, UC Berkeley, 1960s, a golden bear, okay. 
Six feet three, 240 pounds. Give me minus 60 any day and I'll put on more clothes. But give me a high water vapor content and a heat index of 120 degrees and I melt. I absolutely, that turns into an endurance contest for my body type. I have a hard time with those conditions. And I'll only take off so many clothes. <laughs> but yet that's what we're going through. We've done the statistics on the heat advisories and excessive heat warnings. National Weather Service criteria deployed all over the U.S. And we are now suffering a higher frequency of heat advisories and excessive heat warnings because, not because Collegeville is going to 105 degrees on the thermometer in the summer, but because Collegeville is hitting a 90 degree or 91 degree temperature in July, but coupled with a dew point of 75 degrees. So it makes the heat index feel like 130, or maybe 120, or 115. Now that's pretty hard on our human physiology. That's pretty stressful. And we've seen areas of the state with 80 degree dew points. All these observers through the state since 1996 have reported at least one day of an 80 degree dew point. And with the heat index history in the state of Minnesota documented in my book goes all the way back in its documentation to 1883. And we actually had loss of life in Minnesota in the heat wave of 1917 and 1936. In fact, 1936, we lost over 900 Minnesota citizens to that July heat wave. But all the red highlighted years are heat waves associated not with the mercury thermometer reading 110, but with the dew point spiked at 70 degrees or higher, coupled with a 90 degree temperature or higher. And then we had this remarkable day of July 19, 2011, where the Weather Service throughout the midsection of the country had to put out an excessive heat warning. We had uh, dew points in the 80s. We had these record-setting heat index values reported from all these Minnesota communities. And these are still the records today. This was just back in 2011. And in Moorhead, Minnesota, we had 97 degrees with an 88 degree dew point, and that was later certified as the highest heat index ever measured in the USA. And tied Furnace Creek Death Valley as the highest value ever measured in the USA. Now who, what American citizen would logically associate the climate of Moorhead with Furnace Creek Death Valley? I don't know, that doesn't seem logical to me, but nevertheless, that's what we measured. Consequences, so when we think about the data, the data, as you've heard me say, kind of slap you in the face, especially when you're observing things with greater frequency that haven't been observed before, and it translates into real world impacts. So we have soil and lake freezing behaviors that have changed. So the season in which our soils are frozen, and I'm sure Joel, Joe's read about this, and or if you're a hydrologist, you've read about this, our lakes are frozen for lesser calendar days. Our soils are frozen for lesser calendar days. Uh, our farmers have to change the way they manage soils. So those who apply fall nitrogen don't want it all to volatilize and disappear into the atmosphere. So they have to wait later and later and later and later in the autumn season for the soil temperatures to cool down below 50 degrees. We see in the biological consequence, we see now that a lot of our insect species can overwinter and survive here. Or plant pathogens, plant diseases for that matter. Or we see reduced heating degree days, so that kind of helps the pocketbook in that we maybe don't have to run the furnace quite as much. We see change in plant hardiness zones. So the Minnesota Landscapers Association loves this because now when you buy a, a new house or move into a new property or say you do a commercial construction and you want to landscape it, you have a broader array of plant material with which to landscape it because the number of planting zones in the state of Minnesota has increased because our climate has changed. 
a uh, longer frost-free growing season, uh, increased number of freeze-thaw cycles. We were talking about this a little bit earlier today, too. How many of you think our roads are well cared for? Okay, we now, in the average Minnesota winter, from the southern half of the state down to the Iowa border, have five times more winter freeze-thaw cycles than we used to have. And our roads don't like that. Our roads don't like that at all. Uh, we've got changes in animal migration, hibernation, foraging, a whole bunch of things. Carol Henderson, our bird biologist with the DNR, says not, that we now have at least 17 bird species that don't migrate out of the state. They just stay right here. Uh, we have longer exposure. The mold and allergen season has increased. Maybe some of you have suffered from that. But the Mayo Clinic has written a, a great deal about this. Uh, and then we have, as I mentioned before, the heat advisories. What about the tropical dew points? Again, we have a biological effect. There's justification, there's climate justification for why the University of Minnesota recently developed and deployed the new Invasive Species Research Center on the St. Paul campus. Because we had to. We're the climate is carving new niches in the state of Minnesota that are suitable for a variety of, of new species. More attention on livestock and the stressors on livestock and more environmental controls for the livestock producers in the state. Uh, and increased demand for environmental controls. Any building that requires real stringent environmental controls is having to revisit that because the stressors are tending to dry, make it harder and harder uh, for that kind of thing to take place. In terms of the moisture side of things, we're altering uh, more drainage systems. Tile drainage has quadrupled in my lifetime. The area under tile drainage in our farm sector here in the state of Minnesota since the 70s has quadrupled. Uh, runoff sediment shoreline management, huge efforts now, especially to protect our lakes. Change in storm sewer runoff designs, many cities have redesigned their storm sewer runoff systems for higher capacity because they've had to. They don't want all the, all the uh, houses, uh, basements flooding all the time. Uh, modified fisheries, we've heard from the DNR about that and about uh, mitigating flood potential. The Association of Minnesota Floodplain Managers has had their work cut out for them in recent decades, trying to mitigate the flood risk on all kinds of watersheds and even setting them aside, we have the Army Corps of Engineers building a $2.1 billion diversion on the Red River around Fargo-Moorhead now. So we are seeing consequence associated with these. And then this finally gets us to the point of dealing with uh, science and science ethics, albeit mostly related, in, at least in my experience, uh, those ethics related to climate change. But we have a cognitive, emotional, ethical, and political dimension to all this that we at least minimally, when we have community engagement on this matter, have to acknowledge. We have to acknowledge that we have a certain amount of knowledge, uncertain knowledge as it is, to bring to the table. Now, here's where we have a little disparity between if we're bringing to the table true measurement history in the state of Minnesota that shows what we've measured in the past and what the recent trends are versus model projections of what the next 70 years are going to look like. And the disparity there, and I visited with a few of you about this earlier today, is increasingly alarming because the measurements we have in hand and analyzing the trends in those measurements in our lifetime is showing a pace of change in certain parts of Minnesota that exceeds the pace of change in the model projections. So if the model projections are underestimating the pace of change in Minnesota, we better be aware of that and we also better get our you know what's in gear to try to do something about it because we don't have a lot of time left to mitigate this. Uh, the ethical dimensions, more and more, I mentioned to some of you that we have 
a long record in Minnesota, uh, when we go back in time, of invoking a certain form of morality when we deal with certain societal issues. I mean, that came in, into play in our lifetime in a variety of ways. One that was very heartfelt by many of us was the same-sex marriage law, for crying out loud. And how many states have gone along with this in that two people, regardless of their sexual orientation, that love each other, should fundamentally have a right to get married, for crying out loud. Uh, so we've got all kinds of things that we've approached the morality to, and now, published in the book that, uh, by Wynne Stevenson that we talked about today, as well as many other books, people are trying to bring in the morality dimension and the climate justice dimension into coping with and having discussion about climate change as an important issue. And then, of course, the politics. And the politics really start with all units of government. They really do. The local unit, the city, the city manager's office, the local mayor's office, the county commissioner's office, the watershed district office. Okay, and then we work up to the state offices and the state agencies, and we work up to the federal agencies and the federal leaders. It, it, it should be approached at all levels. And we have, in my lifetime at least, made some inroads and some progress with a lot of local units of government. In fact, uh, in Minnesota, I would say we almost role model that. There's been a lot of effective leadership at the local scale in the state of Minnesota in terms of coping with climate adaptation strategies. That'll be exemplified, by the way, for those of you that have an interest, next month on November 14th, when the annual statewide partnership in climate adaptation hosts its annual meeting, and we'll actually hear from a host of practitioners of climate adaptation and what's worked successfully for them and maybe what's failed or not worked so successfully. But it's important to share that information on an annual basis. So all of these are very, very important. Uh, one other role model, I mentioned role models earlier, and some of us have tried to think, how can we have a national leadership that Teddy, analogous to what Teddy Roosevelt did back in his day as making conservation and the practice of conservation in the American landscape an American value. That's the kind of leadership we need. We need somebody to come along like Teddy Roosevelt did with conservation, and we need to have climate change adaptation and mitigation an American value. I don't know if that's going to surface in your lifetime, but I'm sure hoping. Maybe we're talking to somebody in the room here tonight that's going to evolve into a leader in that arena. That would be magnificent. But that's one direction that we need to go. Uh, the science rally uh, two years ago uh, at the state capitol uh, turned out about 15,000 people. Was anybody in the room at that? So we do have a couple of hands. That was a magnificent turnout to support science in the very first months that Trump and the Trump administration took office. And it was needed. We needed to have a supportive public demonstration for science. Because we've been quite honestly had a, a science attacked and distorted by misinformation over the last two or three decades, and we've got to shed that. We've got to find a way to get around that. And, uh, and then when we talk about the dialogue and spiritual, I'll share this. We have two entities that I'm proud to have worked with, although it was right at the end of my career, so I didn't necessarily put together a long track record. But the Minnesota Climate Adaptation Partnership Committee was founded in 2007 under Government Palenti and it brought together a whole host of organizations to work on promoting climate adaptation because we were already seeing the significant impacts of climate change in our state. They were already surfacing in a variety of arenas, public health, transportation, uh, water management, 
agriculture, energy, et cetera, et cetera. And we've worked continuously to expand that partnership and build it into what, we, what I refer to as a practitioner's conference, where we routinely each year get together and we learn from each other about at all scales, at all scales, what can work and what doesn't work, who to partner, who should be the partners involved, how do you go about deploying this, how do you go about raising money for this, how do you go about measuring the impact of this. And we've got many, many, many enthusiastic champions of this movement operating within the state. And I'm hoping that that just carries on forever because we, we need that. We're not the only state doing that. There are in many other states, at least 24 other states, there are similar entities operating in those states uh, taking uh, a, a, this type of approach to climate adaptation. And then two Mays ago, in the May of uh, 2016, we hosted the National Adaptation Forum we had all 50 states represented. We had 1,600 attendees down at the River Center in downtown St. Paul, where all these local and state units of government people, all these people got together and shared what was working in their specific environments with respect to climate adaptation. And at that forum, we were able to put together a religious leaders forum to talk about creation care and the role of religion in looking at creation care and climate change and how to respond to it. The four religious leaders that we brought to that forum were all wonderful people. They came from uh, all different walks of life. And with gratitude, they put together a statement that was published in the proceedings of that forum and you would not believe the feedback we got from that. It resonated with a lot of American citizens. That we are, we are obligated, we are part of God's creation. If you read, regardless of what form of the Bible or, or what religion you come from, if you read the documents, the founding documents, of so many of these religions, we were given jurisdiction to be stewards of the planet Earth. That was an intended mandate for our species. And so they acknowledged it by a statement that wraps up with this call to action, and then they all signed it. And you can see all the names, all these people are prolific writers and researchers and religious leaders. And we think we started something because now we think the National Forum, which is held every two years, is going to have more widespread discussion at the national meeting on the ethics and morality of climate change. So we think we planted a seed that's going to stay with the National Forum uh, at the, and, uh, and go on uh, into the future, which we really feel good about because we think that kind of dialogue was needed. So that's my story. That's my evidence. It also kind of reflects where I'm at in my own thinking on this topic. Um, I am dedicated to continue, one, uh, as they say, once an educator, always an educator. Uh, so even in retirement, I'm going to continue to uh, try to educate about climate change and try to be an active participant uh, and maybe even uh, do some rather radical things since I'm no longer bound by the university faculty restrictions about participating <laughs> in certain things. And what are they going to do to an old, limpy guy anyway? <laughs> so um, I'll be happy if you have comments or questions. Anybody bring any questions tonight that they'd like addressed? Because we've got microphones out here. And uh, anybody want to, any brave souls, you want to come up to the microphone?
Um, um, when you were talking earlier about um, the how Minnesota has become more and more wet, uh, is the climate change like the increase in temperature? Does that had has that had an effect on like the increase in wetness, or is that just a uh, correlation? Be, be like, is, it, is that relation caused by climate change, or is it just a coincidence that's happening at the same time? Uh, okay, if you didn't hear that. Uh the gentleman's asking me about the link, if there is a logical link between the temperature change I talked about and the moisture change, and then to what degree is all this folded into the climate change umbrella. They're both a piece and they are linked because as the temperature has warmed in Minnesota, as the atmosphere has warmed in Minnesota, its mixing depth has increased. The lower part of the atmosphere which meteorologists call the troposphere, is the mixing medium for heat and moisture. That's where the clouds form, that's where you have the updrafts, the downdrafts, and everything else. And as the volume of the atmosphere has expanded with increasing temperature, its capacity to hold moisture has expanded. And so if we dissect that one step further, and we look at the climatology of the radiosonde or balloon instrumented measurements that go all the way back to World War II over the Minnesota landscape, we find that all the maximum precipitable water measurements, column water vapor in the atmosphere over Minnesota, all the maximum values for every day on the 365 day calendar have occurred since 1991. So with ex expansion in volume capacity, we have a higher potential for precipitation just based on water vapor storage in that expanded capacity. So that links the temperature and the moisture signal. In fact, it links all three signals I alluded to. It links the temperature with the water vapor or the dew point and the intense precipitation. So they're all involved in that dynamic. And high, at even higher latitudes, it's an even more profound dynamic. For example, up at 59 degrees north latitude in the summer of 2010 on the Arctic tundra around Hudson Bay in Canada, they had their first ever four inch thunderstorm rainfall with cloud tops over 40,000 feet. That's how deep the mixing depth was. Four inch thunderstorm rainfall falling on Arctic tundra, instant flood. So that's pretty disturbing when you can get that kind of dynamics in the atmosphere at that high a latitude. Yes. Um, th th thank you for your lecture, Dr. Seeley. Um, what are the, um, the things that human beings are doing which are most uh, dangerous, uh, most contributing to climate, uh, to global warming? And, and, and so the other part of that question is, uh, in practical terms, what would you say that, that we need to do or avoid doing in order to, um, to try and help not make the, t uh, the average temperatures increase even more than they are doing now? Oh, okay. Did everybody hear or you need that repeated? Is that pretty clear? Okay. I, uh, I'm not an expert in mitigation strategies. I admitted that earlier in the day. Uh, I'm kind of a data measurements uh, specialist, but I've, I've interacted with enough scientists that I know there's two drivers of climate change that we could mitigate. There's mi minimally two drivers of climate change we could mitigate. One is landscape disturbance. Uh, we could have done that with the Alberta tar sands, but we didn't. Instead, we took out boreal forest equivalent to the size of the state of Florida to develop the Alberta tar sands. So we changed the climate, okay? Uh, the Chinese, when they built and uh, deployed the Three Gorges Dam and inundated millions and millions and millions of acres of agricultural land in southeast China, changed the climate. Uh, and the second driver is atmospheric composition, what we're putting into the atmosphere. 
We're beyond 400 parts per million on carbon dioxide, but that's just one constituent that drives climate behavior. We got methane and nitrous oxide and a whole host of other things going on. And so if we could somehow find ways to mitigate that and mitigate that in a hurry, we could have a dampening effect. Now we're already, as you've probably read, uh, all the models suggest that we're already committed based on what's already happened as of October 24, 2018. We're already committed to a certain amount of climate change. Even if we had a net zero change in atmospheric composition as we migrate into the future. But we need to think about mitigating that. Where we break down, and unfortunately as scientists we can't answer the public question, and this is an important question, is when you look at specific climate change in a geographic region of the world, and I already alluded to the notion that there's a disparate signal. Some parts of the world are changing profoundly and some very little. But when you dissect that at the drivers of that net change, we don't quite have the answers yet. So we can't say, like, for this geographic region, the reason the climate character has changed like this is 70% landscape change and 30% atmospheric composition. We don't have the knowledge base yet to say that. So we're loath to even make a guess. But we do know that the drivers are there, that they're having an effect, and that we have the potential to mitigate those drivers. So, and we think, as citizens, not scientists, but we think that that's enough knowledge to act on. Does that make sense? Because sooner or later, as a citizen, you have to decide, well, what's enough knowledge to act on? And most of us think we're already there. We don't need to get this extra desired precision. So that's a real important question, and believe me, that gets asks, what you just asked, is, it gets asked at almost all the national forums. Because for some citizens, that's really, they really want to understand it at that level of detail. But unfortunately, we haven't evolved well enough in the science yet to really get down to that level of detail. Anybody else? Well, I'll hang around for a while. Oh, we got one more over here. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I know in regards to the book, um, Stevenson focused a lot on like the morality of climate change. So I guess my question is just like, what are your thoughts on focusing on climate justice as a moral issue? I like. Um, uh, I have a sort of a conditional response. As a Christian. And as a citizen that cares about the community I live in, I like making the moral argument about climate justice. I really do. Uh, and, uh, I, and I think uh, morality makes a good argument, not just on climate change, but there's other issues we have to deal with where it makes a good, a good argument. But I don't think it should be the sole argument. I think as a scientist that we need to try to understand what the data are telling us, try to associate what the data are telling us with specific coherent impacts that are affecting things that we value, that have morality tied to them. So I think there's a big integrated picture that we should all be thinking about in that regard. But I do like the element of morality. I think it is an important element that we talk about. And uh, to those of us where it's, we're deeply passionate about it, that we express that. I don't think we should hold back on expressing that. For some American citizens, including Wynne Stevenson and others, Bill McKibben and many others, that morality argument alone is, is, is enough. So, uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm more, I, I like to see the other pieces come into play. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. I suspect that remediation of this issue is going to take a long time. Probably not in my lifetime. However, I have grandchildren who are like six, seven, eight, you know, that age right. range. Right. Um, 
And I am wondering, what kinds of resources are there for parents, elementary school teachers, because I think it's that generation who, who that has the best shot of leading us in, yeah. into uh, uh, a, a brighter future, <laughs> or maybe a cooler one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm with you on that, because I too uh, love my grandkids, and I care about what world they're going to have to put up with. Uh, the, um, that's a tough one. I, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, a government agency, has worked with the um, AGU, American Geophysical Union, and the American Society of Agronomy to amplify and enrich the lower grade, the primary grade science curriculum on basic climate science and climate change. And there's more and more resources available that I'm aware of for school districts to deploy in the teaching of climate science and climate change in the school systems already. We just have to provoke those people to use them. And uh, I, I think I admitted to some of you earlier today, I taught school science teachers for 22 years. And I taught climate science and climate change. And I know a lot of that curriculum has appeared already in the Midwest in about 240 different school districts. So I know some of the elements that are already in the school curriculum because I've had a hand putting them there. But I think we got to get that more widespread and we got to remember to keep that up to date because we're learning new things each year that should be updated. But hitting them with the primary grades and then continuing through the middle grades and then even into high school uh, with a proper science curriculum is really, really important business. Now I disagree with you on the American intellectual capacity. I think if we could ever get the American electorate on the same page, so we all acted uh, with, 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 uh, with great exuberance and with heavy investment in climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation, that our wealth of intellectual capacity could vastly accelerate the mitigation of this if we put our minds to it. Now, maybe not in our lifetime, but I think it might be still potentially enough to mitigate and make it less harsh for our grandchildren. But we still gotta push, we gotta push, push, push to get that moving. In fact, that was the bottom line of the recent IPCC report. The recent IPCC report had a bottom line message, look, the pace of change in the earth climate system is exceeding what the models tell us by the way we measure it. It's happening so fast that we're running out of time. We better get moving on this. And that was kind of their bottom line message. And they're not scientists who are in it like a game. They're not scientists who are trying to play the public. They're not scientists who are collaborating with some this, isn't, this has got nothing to do with all these climate scientists getting together around a table and saying, gee, what's our public relations strategy going to be? Because we're not that type of people, for crying out loud. You know, this is just people trying to get out a sense of urgency based on pure science. That's all it is. Uh, but a lot of people don't seem to want to believe that. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I, uh, I know the evening is, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm just curious about what's your strategy for trying to inform or educate citizens who don't care, like, at all? And they use the classic, like, I'll be dead. And how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you tackle oh, you know, trying this... to educate people who, like, oh, have no interest in it? Yeah, I, 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 I know... This sounds, I don't, I, don't mean, I don't mean to belittle your question. Your question's very valid, okay? Okay? But what I find hard to do is to try to give somebody a prescription answer because the reality is it depends on who you're talking to. It depends on what they value, what they covet, what's important to them, okay? Now, 
That can be a piece of your strategy. In other words, if you're dealing with a family member, a relative, or a friend where you disagree on this topic or something like that, if you can learn what your audience or what your, 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 your party really cares about, what do they covet? What do they care about? Why are they in this life? What do they like to do? Where do they like to go? How do they like to spend their time? And then you can somehow relate a climate change impact to something they value. Then you have a table to stand on. You can actually engage people. But you have to make the investment to try to understand what their values are, where they're coming from, and stuff like that. And sometimes that's impossible. Sometimes people don't want to let you in. People are very protective. You know, you got some people that are very transparent, and you get to know them real well, and you know what they care about. And other people will never tell you what they care about. I mean, it kind of, you know, it's a, it's a real communications piece that has to be individualized or at the best customized to who you're dealing with. So writing a prescription that says, oh, take this approach because this works 99% of the time, I think that's BS. I don't, I, I, I've never subscribed to that. You need to try to understand the people you're, deal, you're dealing with, where they're coming from, what they value, and then see how you can make a, how you can make a linkage there. And it's very hard work. There's nothing easy about it. But you know, that's the other thing, is uh, God designed us as a species, we're supposed to be capable of hard work. That's why we got a brain. So, you know, don't shy away from it, but just keep, just keep trying along those lines. I'm trying to be encouraging. You know. so, so, okay, yeah. Uh, Dr. Seeley, thanks for being here this evening. I appreciate your remarks. I also appreciate the, the generous uh, alum who provided the, uh, Dr. Stevenson's book, uh, Wen Stevenson's book. And I think the, the line that took, literally took my breath away on a flight not too long ago was reading that my 11-year-old daughter has a higher likelihood of dying of climate change than some other diseases that we're more used to attributing to death. Right. Uh, the, the guy on the plane next to me literally turned to me like, are you going to be okay? <laughs> and I... And I don't know no. that I am going to be okay. So the, the question is, has to do with uh, kind of going to your button there of science, not silence. Yeah. And that line got me as a, a dad pretty, uh, pretty right. hyped up. So I'm just curious to know with a button like that, what, were you, what are you suggesting we do that might be radical in nature where we can take some action? Where do we turn? Where do we, who do we call? What do we do to address these issues in, in possibly a very radical way? Well, okay, did everybody hear that okay? Okay, there's two strategies that I firmly believe in. One is role model yourself, because we all have circles of influence. Every single one in this room, regardless of your age, you have a circle of influence with other human beings that is directly related to how you behave and what your choices are, what your habits are, what your decisions are. You can influence people around you with the behavior you choose. And so respect how much, what's, what is your carbon footprint? What's your waste footprint? Okay, what's your water use footprint? Okay, what's your transportation footprint? Okay, do you take care and look after things? Or do you discard and abuse things? I mean, a lot of that is personal habits. So there's a role modeling function as one answer to your question. The other is talk. Stay engaged on the topic with your neighbors, your community, your church, your workplace, people on a plane next to you, or whatever. Stay engaged on the topic. Your lawmaker, your mayor, your city council, your county commission, your watershed district, your state legislator, your let them know that this troubles you, this is of great concern, it's affecting you in a variety of ways, and that your citizenship mandates that you speak up about this. And just stay engaged on it, because it might not be top of the list. It might not be your number one as they say, you know, everybody has their personal worry box. 
I know I do, and I'm sure all of you do, but it might not be number one. Maybe there's a chronic disease in the family. Maybe there's uh, any number of other things that uh, you got to worry about. But climate change and its effect should be somewhere in the top 10 on, for most of us. It should be somewhere in the mix because it's going to be important. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be important for uh, everybody. If you're a human being, it's going to be important to you. And so staying engaged, and that just requires a lot of persistence, that you don't just let it go, but that you stay engaged on it and, uh, and go from there. Those are the two, role model, the behavior that you would like to see in others, and then stay engaged and have conversation and let your people in your local community and your local units of government know how you feel about this issue. Uh, and, then, and then go from there. I don't know anything else. And those aren't magic words. I mean, that's just, uh, that's just one way you can approach it. So that's the Minnesota way. <laughs> that's, the, that's the Minnesota way to do it. So anyway, uh, I thank you for your uh, patience. I said this earlier to the students, and what I watch for when I'm talking about this topic, I've been looking at your faces, okay? There's a lot of nonverbal communication been going on in this room. And by golly, everybody I've been look, looking at tonight has been engaged. You've been paying attention. I have a feeling that there might be some further conversations that take place. I hope there are. Anyway, but I thank you profoundly for that attention. That's showing me a lot of respect, and I really appreciate that. That's very, very kind of you. So thank you very, very much. Okay? Let's thank him once more.